You're listening to A Temple Wild, Episode 3, The Melisai, Oracular Bee Nymphs. Hello and welcome to A Temple Wild, where we rediscover the myths of the ancient Greeks through the plants and landscapes that shaped them. My name is Ecstasy, and today's episode is going to be just a little bit different. Um, We won't be looking at any one particular myth today, but instead we're going to be turning our attention to the Melisai, who were the bee nymphs of ancient Greece. And by the time you hear this episode, it's probably going to be late March, and springtime is in full swing, which is bee season. Everybody is buzzing around all the plants and the flowers. Um, But as I'm writing and recording this episode, it's actually still quite cold here on the mountain. Um, There's a fire burning in our wood stove, I've got a hot cup of tea in my hand, uh, and I'm all bundled up against the chill that's coming from the windows and the walls of our our not-so-well-insulated village house. Um, But uh, I saw my first bee of the season just a few days ago, which was really exciting because, like I said, it's actually pretty cold here still. Um, I'd opened my front door to go get some kindling for the fire, and there B was, hovering over my welcome mat, like a guest who had just knocked on the door. And B flew over the doorstep, sort of hovered for a minute just inside the door, and then turned around and flew off again to who knows where. And it was during the first few days of what I like to call the air season, which is a time of year for nesting and organizing and celebrating the element of air. The air is a collector and a gatherer of ideas and words and concepts. And so in my personal practice, this season is especially a sacred time for honoring the bee, that most industrious of gatherers. And so bee's presence, it really felt like a blessing of the house for the coming year, that it showed up just just at the beginning of the air season, just kind of entered the house and then flew right out again. There are 20,000 species of bees that we've recorded on Earth, and most of them do not conform to what most popular opinions or thoughts are about what a bee is. So bees can actually be solitary, they can also be social, they can be stingless, or they can be deadly, And only seven species, yes, that's only seven out of those 20,000 plus that exist, only seven of them produce honey. So as a whole, they constitute the largest percentage of the Earth's flowering plant pollinators. They're absolutely vital to the web of our world and the health of our planet. The most well-known bee in the West is the Apis mellifera, which is the European honeybee. And it's been, I guess what you could say, domesticated for over 8,000 years. And as with most of Earth's creatures, honeybees are spectacular. The hive in particular is a study in order and balance and devotion with anywhere from 20,000 to upwards of 60,000 bees working together at once to sustain their colony through foraging. They're organized and working as a collective. They dance their messages to their colony, and one colony can be responsible for pollinating nearly 20 million flowers in a day. There's so much wisdom to be gained from observing bee, and not just the common honey bee, but also our wild and non-honey producing bee species as well. So for modern practitioners who want to reconnect with ancient Mediterranean ways, which is what Temple Wild is all about, um, bees are really considered divine messengers. They're conduits for prophecy, they're speakers of divine truths, and they're a source of inspired thought and song. So today I wanted to share with you some of the ancient Greek folklore that's associated with the bee, as well as some of my favorite ceremonies and techniques for connecting with bee. 
So before we start though, I wanted to make a quick note about pronunciation. And you'll notice that throughout this episode, I say melisai to talk about um, the bee nymphs in plural. And in ancient Greek, the word is melisa for singular and melise for plural. But in modern Greek, they say melisa for a singular bee and melises for plural bees. So in English, I've heard also lots of different pronunciations of the word. So sometimes you'll hear um, melise or melisai, melissa, melisses. Melissa, the name for a person, comes from the word for honeybee. So those are just all different pronunciations you might hear for this word. I personally use melisai. I don't really know why. <laughs> um, it just seems to easily roll off my tongue that that seems to be the word that I prefer to use. Um, but like I said, the, the actual ancient Greek way of saying plural would be melisse. So in ancient Greek, the word melissa, um, which in plural form is melisse or melissae, it means honeybee. And it's also used to mean a bee nymph, which is a nature spirit that nurtures, protects, and essentially is the essence of honeybees. So these melissae can be found in many of the same places as other nymphs, mountains, forests, and meadows, but especially near shaded freshwater springs. Some say that the ancient Greeks believed honeybees to be asexual and born from the corpses of bulls that were offered in sacrifice, since bulls were being, they were a sacred symbol of fertility. And so to the ancient Greeks, honeybees were simultaneously a symbol of chaste purity as well as regeneration, and their swarms were sometimes likened to a gathering or a dispersing of souls. For this reason, the term melisai was also used to describe chaste priestesses who were dedicated to goddesses responsible for agricultural cycles and the mysteries of life and death. Specifically, Demeter's Eleusinian priestesses were sometimes called melisai, and her daughter, the goddess Persephone, was sometimes referred to as the honeyed one, and addressed with various other epithets beginning with meli, Meli being the Greek word for honey, to imply her youth, her beauty, her purity, and of course, springtime. As the queen of the underworld, Persephone was allowed to cross from the land of the living to the land of the dead and back again only with the changing of the seasons, which links her intimately, like the bee, with the cycles of nature and the birth-death circle. As for the chaste goddess Artemis, she was a protectress of newborns and patron of midwives who usher new souls into the world. So it's not that surprising that her priestesses at Ephesus were also called Melissae. Dwelling as they often do in rock clefts, caves, and tree hollows, bees are easily associated with the underworld. Passing through narrow crevices that symbolize gateways, the Melissae act as mediaries or messengers between the realms, able to share the wisdom of the earth with mortals. Bees were also once called birds of the muses, another reference to bees as messengers, as birds were associated with omens and the delivery of divine knowledge, and they are often a source of divine inspiration, prophecy, and song. For this reason, the Melissae also came to be associated with the Olympic gods of prophecy, Hermes and Apollo. In the Homeric hymns, we hear Apollo say that he was actually taught the art of prophecy by three Melissae dwelling in the caves of Mount Parnassos near Delphi. There are certain holy ones, sisters born, three virgins gifted with wings, their heads are besprinkled with white meal, and they dwell under a ridge of Parnassos. These are teachers of divination apart from me, 
the art which I practiced while yet a boy following herds, though my father paid no heed to it. From their home they fly now here, now there, feeding on honeycomb and bringing all things to pass. And when they are inspired through eating yellow honey, they are willing to speak truth. But if they be deprived of the gods' sweet food, then they speak falsely as they swarm in and out together. I love the message to be inferred from that passage. It seems to contain both a blessing and a warning. Honey is a precious gift, the consumption of which inspires truth-telling, wisdom, and calm order. But all beekeepers know that there must be moderation when harvesting from the hive. If you take too much honey, the bees will not survive the winter. We're reminded of the bees' centrality to existence, bringing all things to pass, and we're warned that if we deprive the Melissae of their golden food, we could instead inspire a swarming chaos. Much like the bees themselves, honey is a conduit for divine blessing, inspiration, and truth. The Melissae are credited with nurturing Zeus and the Onisos, Dionysus, with honey in their infancy, a way of showing the earth's blessing of the new Olympian gods. And the muses, who in their earliest form were probably nymphs of freshwater springs, are also said to bestow honey upon the lips of gifted philosophers, poets, and singers. Some stories say that those mortals lucky enough to be muse-blessed, such as Plato, Homer, and Sappho, were actually fed honey by bees as infants much like the gods. Honey, water, and mead were probably some of the very first offerings made to the ancestors, and there is a strong case to be made that ambrosia itself, that notorious food of the gods, was in fact golden honey. It's also interesting to note that one of the three original Melissae who taught Apollo the art of prophecy was called Daphne. And Daphne, whose name means bay laurel, and who you might remember from our last podcast episode, she was said to be an oracle nymph on Mount Parnassos long before Apollo's arrival on the mountain. But once Apollo established his center at Delphi, the oracle priestess of his temple came to be called the Pythia, but was also referred to as the Delphic Bee, a nod to her origins as one of the original oracular melissae of the caves of Mount Parnassos. And I can't help but also notice the similarity between the omphalos stone, that sacred stone where the Pythia would sometimes sit and inhale the sacred fumes of prophecy. It looks very much like a bee skep, swarming with bees. So one of the best ways to honor bee, not just honey bees, but also the wild non-honey producing varieties, is to nurture native flowering plants in your garden, create habitats that are welcoming to the nesting habits of both solitary and social bees, and to advocate the ban of pesticides that are harming bees. But for those of us who use bee products, such as honey, propolis, beeswax, bee pollen, or royal jelly, you can also support local beekeepers who ethically and sustainably manage their hives. Choose to be more conscious about the amount of bee products that you consume, and actively offer reciprocity through fostering wild and domesticated bee havens in your community. You may also want to create a special space in your garden or balcony or on a windowsill or even inside your home where you can grow bee-loving plants, offer small bowls of honey, and display any items or talismans that represent bee, such as hexagons, carved beeswax statues, miniature skeps, or drawings of bee. Tied as they are to the cycles of spring's pollination, summer's bounty, and winter's hibernation, bees have so much wisdom to teach us about living in balance with the seasons. For this reason, I find bee to be a powerful ally when performing ceremonies for remembering the dead, welcoming newborns into the world, 
or when contemplating the deep cyclical mysteries of birth and death. Honey can be shared during your ceremonies as a means of blessing or as a conduit of, for inspiration, either through eating the golden food, drinking mead, applying it directly to your skin, or placing a small bowl outside for the melisai to enjoy. Even drinking a regular cup of tea can be transformed into a ceremony by consciously adding a teaspoon of honey and whispering a devotion or stating your intention. Understanding the properties, both medicinally and energetically, of the tree or the flowers from which the honey is made can also impart particular power to your ceremony. So in Greece, the most common types of honey to be found are thyme, pine, chestnut, orange, and wildflower. Spending time near bee-pollinated plants in the garden and in the wild, it's easy to be lulled into trance by the buzzing of their wings and their hypnotizing movements. One of my favorite practices for entering a state of deep relaxation and meditation is to rest where the melisai are gathered and to watch them as they move from flower to flower, their small bodies swaying from the weight of pollen and their droning buzz the perfect soundtrack for hot summer daydreams where inspired thoughts and songs can emerge. As a gatherer and messenger of divine wisdom, the bee is also a powerful ally for oracles, poets, writers, singers, or anyone who uses word to express truth or share ideas. In my personal practice, this ties them very closely to the element of air, and the melisai can thus be called upon wherever you need clarity of thought, eloquence, or creative inspiration. Before starting a creative practice, you could light a beeswax candle, enjoy a teaspoon of honey, or simply call upon the melisai, those birds of the muses, to bless your lips and your pen so that you will write inspired words and share divine truths. So I've shared a few links in the show notes of today's episode on atemplewild.com. It has a few extra resources that you might enjoy, including some suggested books or bee-inspired music, as well as an amazing time-lapse video of a bee hatching and transforming inside of the hive. And as always, if you'd like to download a transcript of this episode, leave a tip in the tip jar, or send me a personal message, definitely head on over to atemplewild.com. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time.